this uh, panel of hot future heating planet. I thought that before um, starting the discussion, I would, I would start by a few facts um, on, um, on the planet itself. And because we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of Insurance Europe, I would use 1953 as a reference point. And the first fact I thought I should point to is, of course, population, because the, the population has increased significantly since then. In, in 1953, um, the population was around 2.6 billion. We have now reached the 8 billion bar. I think this is largely good news because it's uh, reflecting uh, improvements in life expectancy, but also, uh, and also it's the reason why many of us are here today, I suppose, but it also has a number of uh, challenges, uh, one of which is energy consumption. The population does not necessarily link directly to energy consumption, but clearly there is a, a link. And this is um, the evolution of energy consumption, and uh, we see that in the last uh, couple of decades, in particular, fossil fuel consumption has increased a lot, oil, coal, uh, and gas. In recent years, we see an important increase in renewable energy, but not yet to the point that it's meaningfully impacting on uh, fossil fuel consumption. And as we know, this results in uh, an increase in greenhouse gases, um, and we see uh, here the evolution for uh, the three main ones, uh, CO2, methane, and uh, NO2. Um, and for instance, in the case of CO2, 2022 was a record year in, uh, in uh, emissions of CO2. Of CO2. Uh, and this translates into an increase in concentrations of those gases. I will only uh, use uh, CO2 to illustrate that. This is the now very famous uh, PPM, so which uh, um, reflects the concentration of CO2 into the atmosphere, part per million. Uh, we are currently very close to 420. Uh, the level was 312 when Insurance Europe was created back then. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, the pre-industrial level is 280. The level considered safe by the scientific community is 350. And the level considered dangerous is 450. So that shows a little bit uh, the trend and, 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 and the need to act on climate change, as previous uh, speakers have said. Uh, the, um, the next slide is another way of illustrating this evolution. That's the increase in recent decades in uh, concentration of CO2 uh, and the parallel increase in, uh, in temperatures using the now famous uh, color stripes. And on the slides you can see, you can also see a number of key milestones, um, like in 1972, the, the Meadows report, uh, the first UN climate change conference, COP1 in 1995, Kyoto, Paris, Glasgow, so all these conferences without uh, so far a, a significant change in the trend of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that, as we know, translates into increases in temperatures, uh, and uh, the World Meteorological Organization said three weeks ago that we are now um, facing a 66% chance of breaching the 1.5 degrees threshold in the next uh, five years, so between now and 2028. So that shows really um, the, the, the how um, the trend is, is quite clear. And I've included on the slide a quote from the latest IPCC report in March this year that there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So that's, uh, that was the, the, the main message that was picked from this report. Um, so this is a, a little bit the situation and the facts, uh, uh, it's sovereign, but uh, it's also um, uh, where we are, um, and today obviously we want to look at solutions, and fortunately we have a very good panel to, hel to help us navigate uh, through these questions, and what we would like to discuss are the two usual facets of the climate change <coughs> debate, so mitigation, <coughs> how can we, uh, and of course from an interest perspective, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, what, what is the contribution of the sector, and then the second facet, which is adaptation. How can we contribute to um, adapt to a changing uh, climate? So we will start with mitigation. And um, I would like to start with a, with a very simple question to all the panelists, which is how, what is the contribution of your uh, organization, of the company you represent, 
to this objective of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I would like to start with Didier Milro. As all of you will know, Didier is um, head of the insurance and pensions unit in the European Commission in DG Pisma in Brussels. So Didier, what is the Commission's take on this question? Thank you, Nicolas. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to represent the Commission here today. Um, thank you also for setting the scene. I think it's, it's important that we keep these, these figures in mind. I mean, I will not teach you anything new by saying that it's uh, the fight against climate change, the move towards a decarbonized economy is a top priority for the, for the European Commission and the European Union um, in general. Um, this in a very difficult global geopolitical environment on top of it. Huh? We started this mandate with this objective of Green Deal, uh, just out of the financial crisis, and as we all know, we had to go through a pandemic, and we had to go through a, uh, a war in Ukraine, and not, and, but nevertheless, this is still a top priority for us. It's the Green Deal which uh, President uh, von der Leyen has, has presented uh, at the beginning of the college, uh, which has translated into commitment to reduce the, um, to the, 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 the contribution of Europe to, uh, to global warming by uh, really strictly reduce our, our gas emissions by 2030. So this objective is now reflected in nearly all fields of action of the European Union, including obviously the financial service. But it's important to keep in mind that this is really a, a, a very strong horizontal theme. You know, all are aware of discussions taking place at the moment in terms of increased access to renewable energies, new standards for, for, for car emissions, things like this. So every sector faces a bit the same challenge which we are facing, which is to find the right way to move forward while maintaining a competitive and um, and, and a and strong industry in the, uh, in the field we are responsible for. And this is also a bit our challenge in the financial services area. Uh, we have engaged into a, an unprecedented move towards putting in place a regulatory framework which is prone to uh, put in place the right incentives for the industry to uh, contribute mm -hmm. to the financing of the, of the green economy and also incentives to make sure that we can attract more investors and by uh, creating a common language, and I'm referring to the taxonomy in particular, to make sure that we all understand each other when we speak about investment in sustainable assets, uh, and that there is also uh, certainty and reassurance for investors that their money goes into the right direction. So I will now go through all the different steps which we have taken. I've mentioned the taxonomy. We also have rules to make sure that there is proper disclosures in terms of financial uh, product. Uh, we have uh, new rules in terms of the reporting, which the uh, different actors, including the insurers, have to prepare to explain their policies in this respect, what kind of transition they would like to go through in order to move towards a, a decarbonized economy. <coughs> Lots of things are happening. Uh, it's new. Clearly, um, there is a lot. We need to learn a lot about acronyms as well, and from a PhD in acronyms to be able to follow all this. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of work for the industry to digest on that. We are aware of this. By the way, there's a, a packet that's going to come in, the, in a couple of weeks from the Commission, where we will try to make sure indeed that this framework, when we make some proposals to make sure that this framework becomes more accessible and, and easy to uh, so again, top priority, and I will finish there. Also reflected more specifically in the field of insurance, as you have seen, we have included in the proposals for the review of the Solvency II framework, also measures uh, targeted, in my view, to uh, make sure that uh, if that is not already the case, mm -hmm. of course, insurers fully integrate sustainable considerations into their underwriting policies, into their, their risk management, and into the way they, they conceive their, their business in general. And of course, it's quite reassuring to hear Mr. Bronsetter saying that this is something which insurers do naturally, but it's, in my view, also important that the uh, regulatory framework recognizes that and pushes that move even more uh, forward. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Didier. Very clear and quite a, a lot to unpack. We will do that in the in the exchange. I would like now to turn to Lucia Silva, if, if, if this is um, a good way of to proceed. Uh, Lucia is Group Chief Underwriting Officer at Asseguratione Generali, uh, and I would be very interested in your own perspective on the same question: how to contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much, and thank you also for having the opportunity to speak with this audience. And I think that back five, ten years ago, it was not imaginable that you know, the Chief Sustainability Officer would have the chance to speak with uh, uh, all these relevant people in the insurance sector. So I think that you know, the times has changed. In terms of mitigation, what is Generalist doing? Well, in the strategy we are currently developing, and also in the previous one, we have been focusing a lot on climate change, of course. Looking at risk, opportunities, and also impact. And of course, when it comes to mitigation, it's about impact. The impact we can make on our planet, but also on people, because climate change, and sometimes it's uh, not uh, enough highlighted, is also a social topic because of course climate change will cause a lot of inequalities. The first people who will be uh, touched and impacted by climate change will be the most vulnerable ones. So what we have been doing, clearly using all the levers we have to have a positive impact and to reduce the negative one. First, with our core business, so investments and insurance activities. And clearly, we, uh, as a strategy overall, we have the uh, you know, engagement one. Uh, we are an economy based on fossil fuel. And this is a matter of fact. And so the first approach is really about engaging clients, engaging counterparts, issuers, to reduce their own carbon footprint, looking at the 1.5 degrees Paris Agreement scenario. The, first, the second topic is about really investing. We have goals, precise goals, in terms of uh, investing in green and sustainable uh, counterparts, and also in looking at our clients in terms of their current footprint. And that starting, of course, is a learning, uh, let's say, phase. And then thirdly, we need to walk the talk, because if you engage your client and if you engage your counterparts, you need also to walk the talk with your own operation. So we have uh, goals on reducing our own uh, operation. And then, of course, it's also sometimes about stop insuring, stop investing in those activities, in those counterparts that after a, a, a strong engagement, they don't align with the uh, Paris Agreement. And last, then, this is, uh, I think, very important uh, activity, is about learning, is about education. Education of employees, really to make sure that everyone is aware of the risk of climate change, but also of the opportunities and of the impacts. Education of the people in charge of the key processes, our head of insurance, our head of investment, and also uh, our head of HR, to make sure that they really get the point and make sure that sustainability and climate change in particular is one of the, the say, criteria that help drive decisions within the company. So we have this kind of overall approach. Definitely mitigation is a, a big issue uh, because it's really about sometimes also pushing clients first and uh, and you know, they are counterpart, very important counterparts, but uh, I think and we see it as you know, the future. And definitely one of the, I think, key uh, activities is about creating partnership with our counterparts and using our knowledge as insurer, but also as investor in terms of you know, using the engagement competencies that we have uh, to really boost this transition that is definitely is needed, as we have seen from the data that you have presented. Clear, thank you very much. I would like now to turn to Lindsay Keenan, who is a European coordinator for uh, Insure Our Future. Thank you very much for being with us today, and um, I would be uh, inviting you to share your own views on this same question. Thank you, and thanks very much to Insure and Europe for the, the invitation. Uh, I act as the European coordinator of an international group of environmental and social justice campaign organisations with tens of millions of members around the world 
who have for the last five to seven years been specifically lobbying the insurance industry to try to persuade insurers and their trade associations and their regulators to align the investments and the underwriting of the insurance industry with climate science, with the science, with the facts uh, that have been well outlined today. The insurance industry has a critical role to play. We do a number of things. Uh, we compare and contrast the insurance companies' policies with climate science, with what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us of the science facts and realities, with, uh, for example, the reports of the International Energy Association, and we compare and contrast insurers' policies with their peers. Uh, we also lobby uh, the regulators. Uh, we think that insurance companies haven't been moving fast enough, aren't properly aligned with climate science, and that there is a real need for increased regulation to ensure a level playing field. And uh, we're grateful to the European Commission and others for the, uh, the Green New Deal and other uh, other climate proposals, but I think there's still a real lack of uh, a lack of action on the ground. Uh, the realities are still as we see them. One thing, particularly today, I'm very conscious that there, uh, we have a great audience of insurance trade associations and insurance Europe team, and I would really appeal to insurance trade associations to step up and speak out more on the climate issue, help to drive your insurers to properly align their policies, their underwriting and their investments with the urgent need uh, for climate action. And particularly just now, when we've had the, the recent situation with insurers leaving the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, I must say I've been quite surprised, shocked perhaps, that I haven't heard a single thing from any of the insurance trade associations to support their members. I think we'll come to that uh, a little more. Maybe just in closing, and just to be clear, uh, we already have uncovered, uh, we have already discovered more fossil fuels by a factor of six or seven than we can afford to burn. But we still have insurers, your members, who are insuring new fossil fuel development and that's just not aligned with the climate science. It's not aligned with what the IEA says. So as an urgent action, we would ask the insurance industry to stop insuring all new fossil fuel projects. None of them are aligned with 1.5. And right now, as, uh, as you noted at the start, we are due to pass 1.5. We already have climate catastrophes, which we're dealing with, and the insurance industry paying out hundreds of billions a year. But we're heading for 2.5 or three, and a world of disaster, which is not good for the insurance industry and not good for our children uh, and for the planet's future. The insurance industry has a strong role to play. Uh, really looking forward to engaging more with you all uh, on this subject. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we will pick on some of those points uh, in a moment, but I would first like to turn to Bertrand. Last but certainly not least, you are chairman and CEO of CCF, the Caisse Centrale de Réassurance here in Paris, very important body in the whole framework on that cut. Uh, what is your uh, perspective on the same question? First, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's quite uh, difficult for a, a small or medium-sized company um, involved in uh, uh, the service such as uh, financial services uh, to have a, a major impact for in, the, in the mitigation. But at least we, we should show the example, we should show the, the way. Uh, and in particular, for CISAR, working for the whole uh, French insurance market, we, we must be uh, an example. Uh, and that's why we've upgraded our, I will be very concrete, because uh, if we want to, uh, to have an impact, we have to take concrete measures. Um, we've upgraded our head office. 
We've upgraded our uh, head office and we obtained a, a first class certification. Uh, second example, we replaced the company cars by a special offer for employees who come uh, by bike at the office. It's very, very small contribution. Uh, it's purely symbolic, but symbols are important. Obviously, our main contribution is on the asset side as an investor. Um, we, we've already shifted 30% of our total uh, investment book towards ESG investment. And we also, uh, and, we, and we will increase it uh, further year after year. And we've also uh, invest in some very specific uh, game changing um, initiatives, such as uh, the HY24 uh, uh, fund, which uh, funded, which funds um, uh, facilities for the development of hydrogen in Europe. Uh, this is uh, very, very important. And we, we, we have to, uh, to support all initiatives. And we, as a, a 11 trillion uh, euros investor, we have the capacity to, to do it. Thanks very much. Um, so I would like to pick now the point uh, made by Lindsay on, on uh, the importance for uh, insurers to stop insuring uh, new projects. Um, obviously, this is uh, an important objective. I think the question is how fast this can be done. Lucia mentioned that we are living in a fossil fuel uh, economy. That's also the, the reality. And another reality is the political pressure uh, insurers may be under to continue insuring uh, 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 certain activities. And that has probably increased with the geopolitical situation that Didier referred to in the war in Ukraine, the need to replace gas from Russia. Um, so, so the question I would have probably for you is how fast can this process go? What's the responsibility of insurers on one hand uh, to contribute to the transition to the zero, uh, net zero objective and on the other hand to uh, make sure that the lights continue to be on, uh, if, if I can summarize it in this way. So how, how to navigate this complex uh, contradiction potentially? Yeah, it definitely is a complex uh, uh, environment we need to face. Um, I would say that, as I said, you know, we are in a fossil fuel economy, let's say, that's it. <laughs> and. Uh, um, and I think that uh, we, uh, our main lever again is about engagement, really, and, and partnership. Uh, making sure that you know throughout our levers we have, we are able to push the economy towards more you know renewables uh, and uh, also towards reducing some some let's say behaviors during COVID-19 we have been able to work from home we have been able uh, anyway to push the economy. So, you know, um, I, I think that uh, a new way of approaching also the way we work is possible. I have the feeling we are trying to be back before COVID with the very old uh, uh, fashion approaches. This, you know, refer, for example, to the new norm and, uh, you know, smart working. Many companies wanted to go back to, to, to the office, like, uh, and as you say, it is a symbol, you know, like uh, trying to also uh, work with employees to make sure that they believe and, and they understand the impact they can have uh, uh, changing their own behaviors. Then, of course, uh, uh, the, complexity, the complexity is even bigger because, uh, as I said, if you stop insuring or stop investing in a counterpart, uh, this counterpart usually is also you know, connected with the supply chain have, as workers. So one big issue is about creating stranded communities. So again, this uh, topic of engaging and understanding and creating that kind of uh, I would say shared governance on this topic is super key. Um, we have been able, as, as generally really, and we face some, some issues with some sectors, and so we use engagement, we really understood that the impact of stranded communities, stranded workers, of those sectors that are, should be out of the market, according to the numbers we see uh, 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 by the IPCC. 
So really, engagement is, uh, is key. And as a last resort, of course, stop investing again and stop uh, uh, insuring. Thanks very much. Is there any comment from anyone on the same question? Um, otherwise, I'd like to uh, also um, um, invite comments on, on the other aspect that you mentioned, the ZIA, the importance of, uh, of having uh, companies um, um, working together, maybe with a, an insurance Europe hat here. I would say that we saw this as a company-driven initiative and we felt uh, it was not necessarily our role to give an opinion as to whether companies should join the initiative or not, and also not whether they should leave uh, the, the initiative or not. That's how we have um, um, come, to, that's the conclusion we came to discussing it uh, internally and with members, of course. Uh, having said that, I also um, read the, 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 the press release of the UNEP when uh, a number of companies decided to leave and stressing that tackling climate change means uh, a fundamental and urgent need for collaboration, not just individual action. So that's certainly something we can recognize, but how to organize that and whether uh, companies should join such initiatives is, is more the responsibility of companies. But my question is uh, maybe uh, asking other panelists whether uh, such initiative has uh, a role to play in the future uh, and, and if so, what, what role? What role is there for cooperation between uh, companies on this topic? I don't know if there anyone would like to pick on it. Can I maybe start with yes. the fossil fuel economy? And obviously we have, to a large extent, a fossil fuel economy. But I think I would really note, I think it was 50 years ago that Munich Re started to warn that climate change was real. And what we have witnessed for the bulk of that 50 years as a well-organized oil and gas lobby who lobbied against the science, who told us that the science wasn't accurate and who have continued with their model when we should have been transitioning a long time ago. And now the transition becomes more and more urgent. We know now that there are the renewable technologies. We know they can reduce the energy prices. We know that they create more jobs. We know that there's good business to be done. There's competitive business to be done. There are advantages for communities. And we can reduce and lower uh, the impact of climate change. But we need to be proactive in those things. And again, when we talk about the these things, these aren't my opinions or the opinions of the environment movement. This is science. Yeah. These are clear, hard, cold facts. So we can't afford to be insuring new fossil fuels. And in terms of engagement with the oil and gas industry, the oil and gas industry has just made record profits off the backs of all citizens in the, the last six months on the back of the Ukrainian war. Records billions uh, of additional profits. Have they spent any of it on renewables? A, a percentage, a small percentage. Their capex says that they're not in the process of transitioning. So the idea that we're going to engage them really mm -hmm. is a fallacy. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be some movement on. And if I may address just in terms of the, the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, again, you've seen an attack on insurers' ability to have a conversation, and insurers' ability to discuss target-setting protocols funded by the fossil fuel industry, brought to the insurance industry by right-wing political extremists uh, and climate change deniers. And the insurance industry needs to stand up and say that's not right. That can't be allowed to happen. There must be a space for the insurance industry to have sensible adult discussions. And in terms of fossil fuels, we're not about switching off the lights tomorrow. We're very practical. But the science and the IEA and others say very clearly, no new fossil fuels, none. And then a glide path, another tighter glide path of reducing the production which means reducing the amount of insurance that you're providing to the oil and gas industry year, and year in and year out. And it needs to move fast. We talk about 2050, but people talk about 2050 as if we'll get to 2049 and then take a lot of action. 25 to 2030, that's the opportunity we have, and we have no other opportunity. 
and we really invite you to step up and act as leaders at this time. Thanks very much. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I really would like to also touch on adaptation. I just want to know if any panelists would like to comment on what we have discussed so far. Didier. Yes, th sorry, very briefly. Just two quick comments. Going back on the first question about mm -hmm. whether we should prohibit the right to and investment in fossil fuel, uh, this is not a path which we have followed, as you may have seen Lindsay. It's politically very complex. We have followed the path of, you know, working more on incentivizing people to integrate, you know, transition into their management and, and forward planning. That as well is difficult to have accepted at political level. Uh, so we need to continue, I think, to, uh, to try and convince people to, to move into the, at least that sort of in-between uh, position. I wanted to, to, to pass that message. And, and the, um, um, yes, on the, the second aspect, which is, <laughs> The NZA or no? The, 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 the cooperation between, yeah. between, the, sorry, between entities. Um, I think there will be a lot of need to exchange information, experience, data in the future if we want to address this. So I, 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 I'm sure we are going to talk about the uh, type of resilience dialogue in which we are both working, and, and part of this is about exchanging yeah. information. Um, of course, sometimes you know you have uh, legal obstacles, and, and I wanted to anticipate that discussion. I just wanted to underline the fact that even our colleagues in the DG competition have recently issued new guidelines for you know uh, uh, agreements between companies that would make sure that those who are really seeking to um, to foster exchange of information on climate-related issues would be exempted from the. Uh, from the mere application of competition rules. So that, yet again, is another illustration of the fact that uh, the fight against climate change is something which we're trying to, uh, to pursue at uh, different mm -hmm. levels in the Commission. Thanks, Thanks very much, Didier, very clear. Um, yeah. I would say that this, uh, I mean, it was mentioned before, uh, the importance of uh, uh, thought collaboration between insur the insurers, and uh, actually we are here also because we want to be better understand how to tackle the issue that were mentioned before. And uh, so in terms of these, all these alliances, I mean, and on insurance one, we know that there are some issues at the moment, and generally is really supporting the thought and the thinking behind these uh, alliances, especially on the insurance uh, uh, sector, because we believe at the end of the day we are in a learning curve. So, you know, defining frameworks can really help to define a level playing field and then really help and foster competition because, you know, at the end of the day, if I have a mitigation strategy which is not comparable with yours, you know, we don't serve anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think, and also the, the European Commission is going towards more and more uh, KPIs on sustainability to help benchmark the different strategies. And I think this is the way forward. So uh, really creating those kind of frameworks uh, and rules, uh, and here the uh, European Commission uh, can even play uh, <laughs> and, and foster this kind of, uh, of direction, and he's already doing a lot actually, um, to make sure that my strategy is comparable with yours and with all my peers. And this will help actually. This will help a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we think that supporting this kind of uh, working groups mm -hmm. that can really help uh, uh, this learning and, and accelerate the learning. And sustainability is really about uh, improvements, continuous improvement, learning something, and then uh, thinking about how we can do best, and then again moving ahead. So, I do think I do see the value of this kind of working group that can really bring value mm -hmm. to, not only to the sector, uh, which has a reputation, so we also need to mm -hmm. show a leadership uh, in concrete, not only with the uh, high level declaration, but really be concrete about our dif difficult business, because our business is difficult, it's difficult to be also told to, to uh, uh, our customers, to citizens, but really showing we have a leadership, we have a role to play, and not just about having high level, uh, uh, I can say, commitments, but really working within the machine yeah. 
As example, for example, we have been doing within Generali, working within a machine with those people who are uh, the experts. Yeah. So our insurance uh, people, really the expert that can look at the machine, look at the process, and think about how the process could be different uh, to make sure we can embed the mitigation yeah. risk uh, uh, climate change brings. Yeah. Okay, very clear, thank you. Uh, let's maybe move to uh, adaptation because it's really yeah. an important topic also from insurance perspective. There is no doubt that there is a need to adapt to a changing climate. Uh, the challenge here is that it has to happen at all levels. This, this involves very big projects like building a dam, but very small projects like adapting a house. Uh, it has to happen uh, at the global level potentially, certainly the national level, but also the very local level. So many, many challenges. Uh, and the question is what role the insurance sector can play. So I'd like to uh, again ask a general question, how you see climate change adaptation and from an insurance perspective. And I would like to start with Bertrand from your, your experience. Our contribution to uh, the, the adaptation is, uh, is twofold. First, uh, as uh, the, the, the running uh, company of the Nata Na Natural Disasters Scheme, we, we help reduce uh, the protection gap in France. Uh, in fact, in the uh, met metropolitan territory, the protection gap is very, very low. It's below 2%. Um, and it's very important because then uh, you have the price of risks which is included in the premium. According, obviously, it depends whether or not the, the, the tariff is, uh, is good, but uh, it has increased during the last uh, 20 years. It, it used to be 6% uh, uh, additional premium. Now it's 12%. Uh, we are discussing the possibility to increase it further to 18 or maybe more to adapt to the uh, climate change. Um, but still, the uh, Everybody, every household, every uh, commercial company pays uh, a certain price for the, the cost of natural disasters, and it's very important. Our second contribution is uh, the, the modeling of uh, natural disasters, which helps uh, the public authority, uh, the local uh, authorities, um, companies as well, uh, to, uh, to know very precisely what is their uh, exposure to risk, uh, what, is, what could be uh, the efficiency of prevention measures. Um, and we, we have a, a, a specific relationship with uh, the ecology uh, minister in France uh, to, to, to help to, uh, uh, to implement uh, the national uh, prevention policy, uh, and I will uh, end with the fact that part of the uh, natural disaster insurance premium is derived to finance prevention measures. That's how globally uh, the insurance can contribute to the adaptation of the economy and the, all our activities to the climate change. Very good. So coverage, modeling, prevention, all are key words in, uh, in an adaptation strategy. Uh, thanks very much. Didier, would like to follow up on that? Thank you, Nicola. Very briefly, again, there is a, this is also a, an important uh, policy objective for the Commission. We have a 2021 plan and adaptation strategy with several actions. Um, I agree with you that something which will be required initiatives, action at different levels, difficult to have a, a top-down approach here. But nevertheless, we want to play a part of the Commission, and one of the key actions, as you know, is this uh, climate, climate Resilience Dialogue, which we have launched uh, end of last year, in which we are glad to have uh, Insurance Europe as, um, as a key contributor, and you in, in particular, Nicola, as a, as a chair of a, of a subgroup. So the idea is to bring together stakeholders from different sides, from the industry, from <coughs> consumers, organizations, small businesses, local authorities as well, to discuss at EU level the protection gap, try to find common ways to measure it, and find also common ways to, uh, to address it. So we, are, uh, we have been working with this uh, dialogue 
in a few months and mm. looking forward to the report that should come um, that should come um, next year. So um, that's our contribution yeah. to the um, uh, at least the contribution which my director general right. is, 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 is providing to this discussion. Very good. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe from, from your perspective, we also heard from, from Bertrand that here in France the, the coverage is extremely high, the protection gap is very low, that's not necessarily the case in all countries. Is there a way to change that? Uh, and also I would be very interested, I think the audience as well, in, in terms of what, uh, how can uh, uh, an insurance company incentivize their policyholders to take the, the right decision, to make the right uh, moves in order to increase their resilience? A lot of questions. But yeah, I mean, I think that one of the key words is, uh, is prevention, actually. And again, with prevention, it comes also creating partnerships. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, um, the pricing and the modeling of the risk uh, is key, but then uh, you know, there is the model of insurance uh, that, uh, at least for generally, is moving really towards a lifetime partner approach, which means really kind of looking at the needs of the of the customer and the risk and the impact the, on on the customer, and trying to educate the customer in in the way uh, he can be protected. This happens, for example, for the small and medium enterprise with the uh, uh, the the. the um, the kind of uh, uh, also advisory that we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, give like a loss prevention uh, advisory. Um, again, I think that uh, on this topic, the uh, the prevention uh, topic is uh, is the one that we see as you know the, the one ha which has to be developed and not developed uh, as a single let's say in, in, in isolation, but again through partnership because when you prevent. Uh, um, uh, extreme event is really about the way you build uh, buildings, the way you build uh, roads, mm -hmm. uh, the way also you um, you are uh, you, you you make sure that citizen, for example, has uh, have the right alerts. Mm -hmm. So it's really about the collaboration. Public uh, is private, private and private and public. And of course, it's not only about uh, uh, our levers as insurer, but again, it's about lever our levers as insurance uh, companies and also investment companies. And uh, I must say that, uh, especially on uh, uh, on the adaptation, I think the European Commission, with the taxonomy on the insurance sector, uh, really gave uh, again a common and uh, level playing field with some. KPIs we will have to comply with soon, but at least on that topic, um, we will have this kind of common basis to benchmark each other and to understand how to price, how to improve uh, our value proposi proposition for our clients in terms of the adaptation. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, a number of keywords as well here, like collaboration. Um, one of the points we sometimes hear is it's, it's the importance to make sure that everyone has skin in the game and sometimes there is uh, the issue that uh, certain stakeholders do not have the same incentives to take uh, the right decision from a, uh, an adaptation point of view, like maybe municipalities for instance. So, um, that's also another aspect I think that, um, that we will uh, look at um, uh, when, we, when we work on the, on the climate resilience dialogue that Didier referred to. Uh, Lindsay, what's your take on this uh, adaptation question? Well, obviously, we're much more focused on uh, preventing yeah. uh, and re reducing the, the overall global warming, but it reminds me particularly what uh, Sylvia was saying about the, uh, just the importance of the insurance industry, mm -hmm. the reach that you have to your customers across that range of subjects and the ability to communicate with your customer base and start to drive uh, some of how they're thinking about their adaptation and how they're thinking about that prediction uh, is, is a real opportunity, whether it's the, the motor industry, whether it's householders, uh, how they're dealing with flood uh, protection, uh, house building measures. The insurance industry, frankly, from the, the environmental campaigns perspective, is one of the few sectors on the planet that has the real ability to drive meaningful action on climate change, not just in stopping and ensuring new fossil fuel projects, but across the board. And I think there's real opportunity 
for you there because it is about that engagement with your customers and your clients. It's about being that great partner for them and they're going to thank you for it for generations to come. So I think in terms of adaptation, you've got a good story to tell and a real opportunity to, to step into. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I had one question I wanted to ask Bertrand because I know there are talks in France about um, making the current uh, ag ag I mean, agriculture um, more resilient, and I know you are involved uh, to an extent uh, in these discussions. So, can you elaborate on, on what are the plans on how to on that on that front? Very, very quickly. Um, in fact, uh, there is an area in France where there is still some uh, protection gap, uh, and, and that uh, regards um, the crop insurance. Um, and uh, uh, there is a, a reform under discussion to, to reduce that protection gap um, and to, to help insurers of, uh, to, to, to equilibrate their operations. Um, and uh, so the, the idea is not to make compulsory the, uh, uh, the, the underwriting of uh, a policy, uh, insurance policy, but to subsidize, subsidize uh, the, uh, uh, the underwriting uh, to, um, uh, in order to reduce the moral hazard, uh, to, to condition the indemnification to the underwriting of an uh, insurance policy. Until now, uh, farmers are waiting for the public funds mm -hmm. when there is a disaster. So they, they have no interest yeah. to, um, uh, to, 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 to underwrite an insurance policy. And also the idea is in the long term to help farmers to adapt their agricultural methods, mm -hmm. to take risk, uh, to adapt to the climate change, mm -hmm and uh, knowing that they will be covered by the uh, uh, insurance scheme. So it, it, it's quite, uh, quite clever, if I may say. Uh, and we will see if it's uh, uh, efficient, but uh, at least this is a, a, a good step to, to reduce uh, anti-selection and moral hazard. Very interesting, and I think uh, confirmation that we all have a lot to learn from uh, from what is happening in different member states. I think this is a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I would like to now refer to a question from the audience. Uh, we heard which has been um, uh, positive about initiatives coming from the Commission, taxonomy for instance, but I have a feeling from the question that there may be uh, some more critical voices uh, uh, in the room on, on more or less a similar issues. So the, the question is, beyond a clear common goal consisting in reducing our impact on carbon emissions and our involvement in, in the race to net zero, don't you think that the current regulation, SFDR, CSRT, are more focusing on energy on reporting and measuring than really acting? So is, is, are we really, um, and that I think links back to the, ah. the speech of Andreas, are we yeah. really um, um, focusing and, and having the right impact? I have a clear um, uh, opinion on, uh, on, on it. I think that, uh, uh, let me say and provoke a little bit, that reporting will save the world. Because once you report and you are transparent, you publish in your annual integrated report, we have an annual integrated report, data on your carbon footprint of your investments, or on your own operations, or your data also on diversity, equity, and inclusion, for example. I just mentioned some, some of the mm -hmm. uh, hot topic we have in, uh, in Generali. Then uh, something happens, because stakeholders are informed, investors are informed. We use this data, for example, to have roadshows, uh, ESG roadshows with investors that really incorporate ESG consideration in the way they invest. So clearly, this reporting exercise uh, will really help to streamline and have leadership on the topic. So once uh, someone say uh, what you get uh, measured, you get uh, uh, managed, I would say that what you get measured, you get treasured. So mm -hmm. you can treasure what you measure. And I think that it's not only reporting, it's really uh, about uh, having a strategic approach. To have a strategic approach, you have to have a baseline to understand what you have to measure. And it is, for example, what we have been thinking about in all these alliances. So yeah. from commitment to practice, uh, the first attempt was really about, okay, so how do we measure our carbon footprint of investment, for example? 
how, how so how we can uh, uh, think about our respons the, the percentage of our responsibility toward uh, an issuer, an oil company. Wow. <laughs> No, I mean, so uh, I really think that, uh, you know, the effort is huge, maybe too many uh, KPIs at the moment right. on the table. So uh, my real advice is to focus, because uh, if you have too many uh, topics on the table that you don't focus on anything and you can't, can't be strategic, but definitely reporting uh, is, uh, is the tool to be strategic and to be very concrete in tackling the topic. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think we have reached the, the end of the time allocated. I don't know if there is time for one question from the floor, maybe, uh, if there is any request. If not, what I would maybe ask is your final word of the panel. We have touched on a lot of topics. There is much more we could have discussed. Uh, I think there will be opportunities during the coffee break, but before we close, I would like to ask each of you if you would like to uh, very briefly give your uh, final uh, word to the audience. Who would like to start? I, th I think the priority first is to reduce the protection gap in order to internalize the cost of natural disasters and the cost of climate change, in mm -hmm. fact. Clear? Well, I would like to be uh, kind of really uh, support the idea that we have a leadership role to play as a sector. And sometimes I have the feeling we underestimate this leadership uh, uh, role. Uh, and, uh, and I do feel like uh, we have the leadership role to play, but also the power, the means, the tools, uh, really to tackle all the big problems we mentioned. Climate change is, is just one. Inequality will be the second one. So uh, really, we have somehow the power to change for the better. Mm -hmm. uh, the world. So I think that uh, we can be perceived as a force for good. Right. And it's good also for our reputation as a sector overall. Yeah, I would say that the, <coughs> the focus on the insurance industry's role in climate change, both positive and negative, because there are unfortunately those quite negative aspects at times just now, is growing and will continue to grow. We'll ensure that it does. Uh, and so the focus and the pressure on the insurance industry will increase. Uh, I think you'll find it will increase from the fossil fuel industry and their lobbyists, who are not quite as sweet and nice as the environmental lobbyists, honestly. Uh, but what I would really encourage is we're here, and I really appreciate the invite today. We tried to engage with the senior management of all of the insurance companies, a, a number of you, open the doors and we have real constructive dialogue and that's the takeaway I would uh, ask you all to take today. Come and talk to us. Uh, there's, good, there's good opportunity for engagement and there's real opportunity to walk forward together to take the actions that are required on climate change. Thanks. Thank you. Didier? Uh, thank you, Nicola. Maybe I would like to, to follow on what Lucia just said about uh, what you thought about the <laughs> regulation and thanking her for actually embracing it. I think it's important that we actually all move forward. Uh, I know that we have done a lot, maybe imposed on you a lot of new obligations in the recent past, but this has a purpose and I think it's important that we all share that purpose, move forward. I hope we'll have opportunities in the years to come to fine tune things, maybe rationalize and provide a bit of this. I take the point, it's also hard for us, I can tell you, to follow up everything that's going on in this field. But we have a common objective. Uh, we don't want to take the investment decisions at your place. It's your responsibility. But our objective is, is certainly to put in place the right incentives so that we, indeed, together, collectively take the right direction. So uh, uh, I hope that... This concludes this panel on a positive tone. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it gives a, a, a good um, uh, opening to a follow-up discussion in the, in the coffee break with uh, probably some of our colleagues here in the room. I would like to thank you all for your uh, engagement and active participation discussion. I would like to invite you all to express your uh, appreciation in the usual way. Uh,